Our speaker will be Sayyid Suleiman Hassan Abidi. Sayyid Suleiman has attended the Islamic Seminary in Qumiran, completing the major texts in various disciplines. Sayyid Suleiman went on to specialize in advanced fiqh studies in Islamic history. He is currently completing his PhD at the University of Chicago in Near East Civilization and serving as the director of the Beit al Ilm Islamic Seminary, the first fully fledged Islamic seminary in the United States, of which he is the current dean. Tonight, Sayyid Suleiman will be addressing the topic Transmitting Islamic Knowledge in the West. One of the strengths of the Muslim community in the West is the emphasis we place on higher education. When composed, when compared as a demographic, Muslims are among the most affluent and highly educated group in the United States. However, Muslims have been far less successful in erecting alternatives to secular models of education. In this critical lecture, Sayyid Sulaiman Hassan Abidi will discuss the importance of transmitting Islamic knowledge in the West placing emphasis on what the Islamic tradition has to offer that is absent from the Western context. Please help me in welcoming Sayyid Sulaiman Hassan Abidi to the podium with a loud salawat. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب قلوب الصادقين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله أغد عالما أو متعلما أو محبا لهما ولا تكن رابعا فتهلك صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected ulama, dear brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We are coming now to the closing of the conference and in several senses, this is perhaps the most important session. The closing of any event like this is when we have an opportunity to think about what it was that brought us here, what motivated us, what we hoped to accomplish, what we have gained, and now what we need to do with what we have learned and committed to, and what we want to take with us. And so in that sense, even though there are some of us who, because we came from out of town or have to check out, may have had to have already left or may need to be leaving very soon after this program, this is perhaps the session which is of greatest significance. And that's why it's appropriate for us to be devoting it to thinking about the preservation and the transmission of our Islamic knowledge and our values in this society. And so I hope this session will be insightful and that it will be practical and it will not be something which is only about an institution or a seminary or a specialized field that appeals to and interests and seems relevant to some of us, but that it is something that each and every one of us present, every participant in this conference, and every member of the Shi'i community can feel is very intimately related to our life, our goals, and our priorities. And so I want to start by asking 
all of us to contemplate for a moment about what would motivate all of these wonderful individuals whom we saw to come to a conference like this. The organizers, the speakers, the participants, all of these people, what was it that brought them together to create this forum, to engage in that labor of love? And the value system, the important goal that we will find, everyone will have shared, is to be able to better understand and to pass on a certain system of ideals, a system of values, a series of beliefs and practices that we consider to be what define our humanity and therefore are more important to us than our own life and anything that we might have or that we might acquire during our life. That is the weight of what we come together to accomplish as believers. And so if that is what brings us to a conference like this, if that is what, is motivate, what, what motivates the volunteers and the individuals who will put the effort into organizing and into facilitating a forum like this, there are two questions that I would like us to think about. The first is assuming that this isn't the end days and that the black flags that we see right now are not necessarily the black flags that were prophesied and that will spell the last few months or weeks of the worldly existence of humanity. Let us say that for the sake of argument, 200 years from now, 300 years from now, we have human beings and maybe even our own descendants who are present in this part of the world. What will be the most important factor or what will be the most important factors in their having the benefit of the value system and the teachings and the insights of Islam? What can we think about that will ensure that this religion, its teachings, and the beauty of its values will remain in this land for long after our existence and our lives are all but a memory, and a memory if we are lucky. That is the first question. And the second question is related, but it's something that we don't always think about, and it is something that is a very practical question. What is it that makes a civilization or a culture or a nation or an ummah great? What is it that a nation, what is it that an ummah, that a people should take greatest pride in above all else? Many of us, we belong to linguistic groups, to ethnic groups, to national groups that have a great deal of pride in their past or in their culture or in the beauty of their literature. We find that civilizations, they do take a great deal of pride in their architectural accomplishments, maybe in their literary or artistic or aesthetic or poetic or other forms of achievements and accomplishments. And yet what we will find is that in many of those cases, those scientific advancements, those beautiful feats of human imagination and art and architecture and literature, they were achieved at times when society at the very least was not at the peak of its moral performance. In many cases, some of the greatest artifacts that we look to in history and that many people around us will take pride in 
if it is part of their own national history or their own ethnic history, the great empire that the sun never set on, the great nation that was able to build great monuments, they were founded on numerous systems of oppression. There were many human lives and many human souls that were crushed, not just beneath the palaces and the monuments, but even in some cases, beneath the institutions that allowed that culture, that allowed that poetry to flourish. Now, do we take pride in that? Do we repudiate that and say that it is something that therefore disgusts us? What is important for us is to not be fooled into thinking that that technological advancement, that scientific advancement, that artistic or any other form of accomplishment is the primary determinant of what makes a people great. But there needs to be a moral component that is the defining feature. And if that moral component is present, and if that moral component is primary, then you might not build the tallest building in the world. You might not have that same level of superficial advancement, but you might be the greatest of people. Because the moral component is primary. Not that it excludes all of those other features of human development, but it is what we should give the greatest importance to. And perhaps when the hadith tells us, أُغْدُ عَالِمًا أَوْ مُتَعَلِّمًا أَوْ مُحِبًّا لَهُمَا or أَوْ أَحِبَّهُمَا that when you go forth in the morning, be either a scholar or a student, or a lover of the two, or love the two, depending on the narration of the hadith, maybe that is a reminder that in the morning, the very first thing that you should do temporally, the very most important thing that you should do in terms of priority, is to think about that moral dimension, either by seeking knowledge, by conveying knowledge, or by loving and attaching yourself to the process of the preservation of meaningful knowledge. Knowledge of that which determines the salvation of the human soul, the human being, in body, in mind, and in spirit. So the greatness of a human society, it comes not from the superficial dimensions that generally get a great deal of recognition. And even as Muslims, sometimes we talk about the golden age of Islam, we talk about all of the accomplishments of Islamic civilization, and that is something that has an important role in our recognition of the depth and the profundity and the beauty of Islamic history and the application of Islamic teachings that was attempted by Muslims throughout their existence as a community. That's not something for us to ignore. But what is far more important and what is far more definitive of any golden age that we wish to speak about for Islam is the history of the preservation and the transmission and the struggles and the sacrifices for the preservation of the pristine teachings of the Islamic religion. That is what is of greater importance for us. So that one question then is to be looked at not in terms of the monuments, the museums, the chronicles, but in terms of the moral weight of the accomplishments and the developments of a society. And in light of that, what do we think is going to have the greatest relevance in preserving 
our Islamic value system in this part of the world many generations hence. It is going to be the extent to which we develop and we support institutions that preserve, that transmit, that disseminate the scholarship and the values of our religion. If we are able to do that, then the economic well-being of our communities, the political state of our communities and of our society, it will go through its ups and it will go through its downs. But we will be able to maintain that confidence that insha'Allah, our religion, our religion's teachings and our values, they will still have a home in this country. Last night there was a discussion on gender relations in Islam. And some of you may have been present, many of you may, may not have been present. I think some of you may have been age restricted out. I should have been age restricted out of it, but somehow I was allowed to slip in. But there was uh, a very interesting discussion. Uh, and one of the things that did come up was the issue of the nature of privilege and the fact that there are certain groups in our society that are complicit in the privilege that they enjoy. Privileged groups can be on the basis of gender or on the basis of sex or on the basis of race or on the basis of class or however that may be. One of the problems that we will face in any discussion of this issue or the issue of race or any other issue is that the background because of which the issue becomes important and the terms that are going to be used to analyze the issue are from a school of thought, from a culture that is alien to our Islamic culture. And the goals and the aims are alien to our own goals and our own aims. Even such a simple matter as whether we say that this privilege is a matter that people are complicit in or that they partake in and participate in, but that the value judgment needs to be made on the basis of a set of standards that comes from religion. Certain forms of privilege on the basis of age, on the basis of knowledge, are forms of privilege that we as Muslims believe in, in one way or in another, even if they may not have much meaning or much relevance or acceptance in our society. And other forms are ones that we will combat. That's just one example I wanted to mention of the type of question that is coming up in our own time. There are many others that will come to your mind. There are many other issues that will come up 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. And how are we going to be able, as Muslims, not just to respond defensively and apologetically, but to be able to ensure that we can defend, that we can convey, that we can triumph over challenges and be proud of our heritage and have a proactive and a constructive message to give to others if we don't have institutions that are concerned with the preservation and the dissemination and in some cases the reformulation of our religious heritage in a manner that speaks to and is relevant to this society. I hope that in that brief time I have been able to convey somewhat the importance of this project, the importance of this set of goals and if we think about it, then that is perhaps the most important thing that all of us can be doing. And it doesn't mean that we all need to then quit our jobs and say, well, I want to become a student. Because in order for this to be a collective responsibility that we can acquit ourselves of in the best possible way, we all need to be thinking about what it is that we can do 
to support the dissemination and the preservation of Islamic knowledge in whatever capacity and with whatever resources Allah has placed at our disposal. For some, it means to devote themselves full time to the study of Islam. For others, it means for them to play a supporting role by giving their time and their own expertise. For others, it might mean to facilitate fora that allow for the exchange and the dissemination of Islamic knowledge. For others, it might be to provide financial support. For others, it might be primarily to give their, their du'as and their aspirations and their verbal affirmations of support to those who are carrying out this task. But every one of us has a role to play. I would like to conclude uh, my talk, and I want to do so a little bit ahead of time so that we don't get rushed towards the end of the session, by just mentioning three points that distinguish the Islamic system of preservation and dissemination of knowledge. What is different about an Islamic center of learning from an academy or from a scholarly institution? Is it an academic institution or is it something else? Why do we as Shia refer to our institutions of learning as a hawza ilmiya? And hawza comes from the same root as the Arabic word hiyaza, to get and to have control over. I say that sometimes the best translation of that word hawza to evoke its proper sense and significance is to say that it is the wall around the city of Islam, the protective wall, the citadel. One of the distinguishing features, there are three, one of them is that a Hawza strives and aspires to give primacy to the moral feature, the moral aspect of human learning. Not knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but knowledge for the sake of furthering a moral goal. Some of you may have read in history, and even in modern times, uh, of scholars who spent a lifetime engaged in study and engaged in research. And then on their deathbed, they said to their heir, do me a favor and destroy all my books. And from the perspective of the academy, that seems to be a very difficult to understand decision. I'm not saying it's justified in all cases, but why would somebody not publish a work that they have written? You might know of ulama and maraji' who have unpublished works, although they can afford to publish them. Why would somebody be motivated to, in a sense, erase their name from history and say that I want my books to be destroyed? Except to say that the decision, right or wrong, that is not what I am trying to assert at the moment. Except to say, though, that it wasn't ambition that motivated them. It wasn't a career, it wasn't a profession, but it was the moral effect of the research that they have conducted. And for the fact that a scholar could say that I did all that research, and yes, it would make me famous for me to publish it, but instead, I'm not quite sure if it is developed. I'm not quite sure if it is going to morally benefit my society in this current form. And so I will spread those seedlings among my students. I will teach it, and then I will let them develop it. And once it is developed, they will publish it in their own names, and I will burn my books because I am serving a moral mission, not trying to make a name for myself, not trying to make a superficial legacy, not trying to make sure that people know that I was the one who originated. That is something that is an aspiration that you can see alive within Institutes of Islamic Learning and that animate and that inspire those institutions. And you won't find that in many other places, and I say that as an understatement. 
The second is that the Hawza Ilmiya expect, uh, emphasizes the collective life and destiny of us as a Muslim Ummah. When the going gets tough, the Lebanese Muslims and the Iraqi Muslims and the Iranian Muslims and the Pakistani Muslims and the West African Muslims, they don't have a separate destiny. Sometimes we have created cultures, centers, and institutions that do divide and separate us. But if we believe that we are an ummah, if we believe in the primacy of our ethical and our moral identity and affiliation, then our destiny is primarily determined on the basis of our identity as Muslims first, and as followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu was salam second. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And what institution is there that can aspire to be able to preserve that affiliation and that collective identity and destiny? And third, it is the aspiration of the Hawza to preserve the integrated and the holistic nature of Islamic teaching. Not just studying about Islam, not just teaching about the religion, but aspiring to practice it, to live it, to be a role model. And this is something that even within other schools of thought within Islam, you will not find reflected as completely and as beautifully. There are places where there is a tariqah, and there is a spiritual tradition, but then the scholarship might be lacking. You will find places where there is an academic institution within the Islamic world, but then that visible focus on taqwa and self-development is lacking. The aspiration of the Hawza is to integrate the two. Now, a non-ma'asum will never be able to do so perfectly, but we don't need to come back and say, well, this Hawza that you are speaking of with the primacy of the moral order, with the primacy of that collective destiny, with the primacy of that holistic and integrated approach, where is it? Because I don't find it. If you don't find it, then create it. If you don't find it, then support it. And when you want to step in that path, believe me, you will find that it exists within our history and you will find that it exists even today. Read the biographies of our ulama that were written by their adversaries. Look at how Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, a figure who was quite antagonistic towards followers of Ahlul Bayt, or Abu Hayyan al-Tawhidi, grudgingly in some cases, described Shaykh Mufid. Look at how Sharif Murtada was described. Look at how Allama Hilli was described. And look at how, and I won't name contemporaries for various reasons, but look at how people from various schools of thought and even no religious affiliation will describe even our contemporary scholars of the highest caliber in our own time. And you will see that that hawza is not just an aspiration that I am speaking about theoretically, but it is something very practical. And my, my hope and my call to each and every one of us present is that you will consider that a mission that is close to your heart and that you will find a way through word and deed and prayer to connect yourself to that aspiration. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Sayyid Sulaiman, for your enlightening talk. I would, at this point, I would like to welcome both Sayyid Sulaiman Hassan Abidi and Sheikh Rizwan Arastu for the next portion of the session. In 2006, Sheikh Rizwan founded the Islamic Text Institute in, in conjunction with several of his teachers. His most recent publication, a truly, a truly Unique Text, is God's Emissaries, an epic narrative of the Almighty's tireless effort to guide mankind throughout antiquity, beginning with Adam and culminating with the life and times of Jesus, peace be upon him. As for the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Seminary, it was founded in 2014 and, and, is, and is poised to serve as a foundational institution for the Shi'i community in the United States. 
Its vision is to function as an institution of Islamic learning that gives momentum to the idea of transmitting Islamic knowledge in the West. The Ahlbeit Seminary is an, um, is an organic outgrowth of the Muslim community in North America. Let's join Sayyid Suleiman Hassan Abidi, Sheikh Rizwan Arastu, along with two current seminary students, Brother Azhar Shirazi and Brother, Brother Hassan Abdul Karim, for this special presentation about the institution and its place among the Muslim community in North America. Let's welcome with a loud salawat. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد What I'd like to do in the time I have, I have about 10 minutes um, and I want to give you a sense of uh, a comparison and contrast between uh, the, the academy that most of you are probably familiar with and, um, and the Hoza, um, which probably fewer, fewer of you are familiar with. Um, Sayyid Suleiman mentioned a couple of contrasting points between the two. And I'm going to continue his list a little bit. I want to give you a sense, first of all, what the Hoza is not. Because oftentimes there are misconceptions about what, what goes on in the Hoza, what kinds of things are taught. Um, for instance, th there's no turban tying 101 where we're taught how to, how to tie the imamah. Um, <laughs> sometimes, unfortunately, if you've seen, <laughs> seen some of our, some of our, our, our messes of turbans, um, there's no public speaking 101 where we learn how to give, uh, you know, fasting uh, 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 lectures. Um, there's no dua reciting um, class. There's no, you know, how to lead a prayer class. Like, those are p public functions that, that we, we, you know, we have to fulfill and we do our best to try to fulfill those. But those are not, not the core of the hosa. That's not what the hosa um, really is, is meant for. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, the Hosa is an institution that gives um, individuals who want to do the kinds of things that Sayyid Suleiman is talking about, uh, the tools to be able to um, continue to study, uh, un uncover knowledge, and then figure out ways to apply that knowledge to the practical problems of life on the level of our beliefs, on the level of our practice. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a training ground to help us intellectually to tackle these real problems of life. There are a couple of, I think, distinct um, uh, and uh, important differences between the academy and, and the Hausa. One, and I, I think uh, I made my list, I think, separately for Say Salaam, so I'm trying to think kind of how some of them overlap, and I don't want to repeat him, but I, I, want, I think these are important things to, to say. One is this idea that the Hausa is aiming for truth, for reality, right? And that's very different. It's a, it's a kind of a, um, a there's a, a normative um, uh, uh, approach to, to knowledge and reality where we're trying to get to truth, the reality of God's existence and true belief and what is real and what is our duty before God. And it's not theoretical. It's not simply trying to um, describe how things are and how, how people believe, kind of how we expressed it. We're not studying about Muslims and what Muslims believe, but rather what are we supposed to believe? What is true and what are we supposed to commit ourselves to? And that's the pursuit in, in the Hausa. There's an emphasis that one of the cultural aspects in the Hausa, there's an emphasis on um, learning what has been said before, mastering what has been, what has already been uncovered by others, and making sure that you know that well before you even dare to say something yourself. Not cursorily, kind of, you know, getting a survey of a field and then feeling like, well, I have something to offer. Let me, let, let me, let me, you know, say that the first thing that comes to my mind and try to make a name for myself and put myself out there, but rather taking a lot of care to make sure that you've already understood what everyone else has said and what everyone else has already done. And once you have mastered that, if you have something to say, that very carefully, very, with a lot of precaution, it, for fear that, you know, and, and with the, the idea that how could I possibly know something that all these other great people haven't already figured out. So if I know something different, let me first make sure and double check and triple check to make sure that it's, it, it, it is actually sensible, test it out, discuss it, bounce it off of people, and then slowly develop the confidence that, yes, in fact, maybe this is something that might be a contribution that will further, further the effort rather than jumping on that in, in the, the, first, the first go. 
It's a system that encourages uh, humility, right? It encourages humility and it encourages a kind of a connection with the whole. Let me, I'll give you an example to try to describe what, what I mean by this. Um, in an academic setting, what I find is that um, each, each, it's kind of every man for himself, right? A person has um, a, a particular line that they're studying and they um, delve into it and they come up with their ideas and similar to how Sayyid Suleiman mentioned, they are interested in making a name for themselves, publishing that and having that as something attributed to them to get tenure, tenure to get you know, a, a publication and these kinds of things. In the Hawza, one of the tendencies you'll see is as you're researching things, when you come up with an idea, even if it's an, an innovative idea, there's always an effort to try to see whether it's already been said by someone else before or somehow you can go back and say, you know, this great scholar from before, when he was saying such and such, what he meant was the same thing I'm trying to say now. And you're trying to connect it and say, basically, I'm not saying anything new, it's just what, what that person said, but maybe here's another, another way of saying it. And so there's that way of kind of joining with the whole and, and being part of this whole and not necessarily putting yourself out there and saying, this is me and I'm so great, I've come up with this great idea, but rather this is one little contribution maybe to just tweak something or offer something new, but it's basically what someone, someone before said. And, and amongst my colleagues, sometimes we'll, I don't know if this will make sense in English, but sometimes we'll, um, we'll have a new idea and we'll, we'll, tr we'll, we'll, we'll tr go through great effort to try to see if someone else has already said it. We always say like, if, if, a, if a, a dead person has said it, maybe we'll have more credibility. So we'll look for a dead person to put, to put our words, our, our ideas in their words and say he already said it, so we don't have to put ourselves out there first as, as some innovators. In terms of the education process itself, also it's very different from the academy. The way learning happens, in university I, I remember uh, many weeks when I had you know, a thousand pages to read. Um, in a single week of literature and history, these kinds of things. And so there's, a, there's an emphasis on, on a voluminous reading, um, uh, cursory reading, uh, breadth, but not necessarily depth. depth. In the Hawza, it's very different. In the Hawza, sometimes a, a, you know, an hour will go and you might have read three or four lines of a text with your teacher. Right, that three or four lines of a text, it's a, first of all, it's a very dense text. Oftentimes they're de texts that are written hundreds of years ago. Right, and painstakingly you go through word by word, um, uh, trying to uncover the meaning of the text and trying to master what has been said already. The way the education process happens also, there's a, there's a, a, a very beautiful part of our, uh, the culture of the Hawza which is called the Mubahatha. The Mubahatha is a, a, a discussion that the students will engage in after, before and after uh, their, their session with the teacher. They'll prepare themselves before a class by reading, kind of reading ahead, trying to figure out the best they can what's going to be discussed. Then they'll attend the lecture, they'll attend the class with the teacher, go, going through, like I mentioned, with three, four lines, half a page. And then afterwards, they'll sit down with their, their classmates and they'll rehash the same material, teach, teach it to each other. Um, if need be, if they f find that there are areas where they, can, they need to do some further research, then they'll do that as well, go to commentaries and these kinds of things. But it's a, it's, it, 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 you're, you're repeating the same thing over and over again to the point where you've understood it completely. Sometimes you even memorize the idea and the topics. I can still picture the things that I've studied five, six years ago. I can picture you know, where in the book it was, what page it was on, or not what page, but like, you know, what side of the page and where it was. And it's very easy to refer back to things like that because we've gone through it so many times. But I can, I've read thousands of pages in, in college and I have no clue even of the titles because it was such a whirlwind of, of material that it doesn't really stick with you, of course. All right, so those are some of the any major um, differences. I have a few minutes left and I was hoping to kind of go through some of the subjects that are, that are studied in the Hawza. Um, let me mention some of them briefly. So one of the, some of the basic studies that, that a, a Hawza student will engage in, um, there's language of course, Arabic language, um, sarf and nahu. Um, sarf is in a nutshell um, teaching you how to build words in Arabic. Right? What are the patterns that are used and how, how are those patterns manipulated to give new meaning. Nahu takes those world, words, those building blocks, and teaches you how to make sentences. It's very simple, and I'm sure the, the students who are st currently studying Sarf and Nahu and are sometimes um, uh, uh, mind boggled by the detail will, will think that's a very unfair way of representing those two, but it is, in fact, just that. Um, 
There's a, there's a study of logic, kind of formal Aristotelian logic, um, trying to develop the, and understand the ways um, of, of, of arguing a point and proving something and uncovering fallacy and those kinds of things. So kind of that old um, Aristotelian logic is also taught at the basic levels. There's jurisprudence and principles of jurisprudence. In the, in the early stages, it takes the form of simply learning the ahkam, learning the laws that have already been derived by your marja'u taqlid, and going through kind of a survey of that. And then as you progress, going in more detail and trying to retrace the steps of other mujtahideen and how they've kind of understanding how they have derived certain laws and how they've manipulating and manipulated and understood the different sources to try to understand what Allah wants from us. By retracing their steps, you start to learn through almost like an apprenticeship um, how, how the process works and how to approach the, the sources and how to use them in ways that are beneficial and uncover truth. There's a study of theology and philosophy. Um, I say them kind of together because I mentioned earlier as in one of my talks as well that there's, there's a, a kind of a blending in the Shi'i tradition between the two. And many things from philosophy are used in, in, in Shi'i theology as a way to try to uncover truth in our beliefs. To a lesser extent, commentary of the Qur'an and history are studied in the Hawza. I say to a lesser extent because these are oftentimes seen as things that can be um, you're, you're developing the tools to, to, to study, but they can oftentimes be studied and understood um, kind of at a later stage, perhaps through independent study or through some other sort of engagement. But there's not kind of core, core discussions that happen, which seems kind of ironic that you don't study Qur'an in the Hawza um, at these basic levels. But uh, like I mentioned before, the, the Hawza is meant to primarily to give us those tools um, that we can then use to, to further our knowledge. So hopefully with that you get kind of a sense of um, a comparison between the ac academy that you're probably familiar with and this hawza which we're trying to help you to understand. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن صدق الله عليه العظيم Allahumma sayyidina Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So uh, I was brought here to provide for a little bit about a motivation for somebody like myself to go to Hausa and uh, some of the questions I asked myself before I decided to come to Hausa. So the verse I just recited is from Surah Nahl, uh, chapter 16, verse 125. And I felt that this verse of Qur'an provided the background, the foundation for some of the basic things that I felt that I wanted to develop by going to Hawza. In this uh, ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Holy Prophet with the verb ud'u. It says call. He, asks, he, he demands that the Holy Prophet call in particular in a type of way and fashion that would be befitting of his standing. So uh, there's three major things that come from this verse. Number one is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet to call with hikmah, wisdom. So I felt that, you know, if I was going to go to Hawza, that would be one of the primary things I, w I would want to gain, which is this having not just ilm or knowledge, but to be able to develop hikmah. The next thing is to uh, do a goodly exhortation or urgent communication of these ideas, this message of Islam. And then third, to be able to have the skills and the tools to be able to dialogue, to discuss, to debate, 
with other people of different faiths, different thinking processes, with the best of manners. So now that I've kind of put everything into a certain kind of context, I want to kind of, uh, you know, you say rewind a little bit. So I want to get these, uh, I want to get these qualities or aspects inside myself. But the first question that comes to my mind, and I think pretty much goes through everybody's mind uh, when they think about a house inside of America. The first question that came in my mind is, well, I can gain these uh, aspects anywhere. I can go to Qom, I can go to Najaf, uh, and I can gain those things there. So that first question, and a lot of times people would come up to me and they would ask, they say, well, why don't you go to Najaf? Why don't you go to Qom? And obviously those places are, you know, the places that you will attain the highest forms of knowledge. But I came up with an answer that was simple and true for myself. And that uh, I feel uh, puts things in perspective. So these two things that I feel that I, I, I kind of answers I came up with is that the, the house does two things. Number one. By going to house in America, I, I feel like it provides for me a certain level of grounding. And what do I mean by grounding? I mean a grounding in the reality of the issues and dilemmas and problems that are affecting the Muslim American community. And this is important because sometimes we all often hear of people complaining. They say, oh, the ulama, they don't understand us. They don't really connect with us. They don't really know our issues. They don't know our problems. Well, a, a house in America provides for filling that, that vacuum. So if I stay here four or five years and I make sure I'm grounded in the reality, the issues, the problems that are affecting the Muslim American community, then I feel that I won't become, inshallah, aloof uh, to these issues if I were to study further in the future. Number two is pragmatism. I feel that sometimes uh, many people have studied numerous years in Hausa, but they come back to America and they seem not to be as pragmatic as they should be. They don't really know how to apply this knowledge to solve uh, some of the basic dilemmas that are affecting our community. So those two major things of grounding and pragmatism, I feel, provides the foundation for why I decided to go to Hausa in America. So with that said, I'm just going to close uh, with this final point. Some of the aspirations that I feel that would uh, uh, I'd be able to develop while I'm going to Hausa is that in the future, you know, one of the things that I see is not simply that uh, we have issues inside the Muslim American community that need to be solved by competent ulama. But there's also issues that affect that our, our la larger society at, at, uh, as a whole in America. These issues are often not addressed because they don't know how to address the issue. You have to be aware of an issue in order to address it. So I feel that by staying grounded and staying pragmatic and staying uh, in touch with the reality that exists both inside of the Islamic American community and the wider American community at, at large, it pro provides me the ability to be able to connect and to stay in touch. So I want to end on that note. Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحددي لولا أن هدانا الله. On behalf of the uh, students of the Ahl Bayt Islamic Seminary, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. First uh, and foremost, it's incredibly encouraging to see uh, such a reputable organization and conference such as the Muslim group being so supportive and encouraging for these efforts, it's, it's incredibly inspiring and encouraging for us, those of us who um, have started on this humble journey. And for that, uh, I want to extend my, 
my personal thanks. Uh, it really does entrench and remind us that we really are in this together. I've been asked to speak a little bit about my own motivations and reasons for why I decided to move uh, into the in the direction of Hausa studies from a very uh, humble beginning in uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if my teachers would allow me, when we came to recognize who would be the the faculty and the teachers teaching here in Chicago, quite honestly, the decision was a lot easier. You've seen for yourself uh, a glimpse of the caliber of, of knowledge and competence that is in the personalities of Sheikh Faizi, in Sayyid Suleiman Hassan, and Sheikh Ridwan. And so with that being said, um, it was not really uh, too difficult of a decision but we were honored to be here and learn as much as we can from them. But that being said, of course, I don't think these decisions can be solely personality-based. At the end of the day, we do believe in the project. We have a principled commitment to the idea that Islam should have a scholarly place in the landscape of America. That being said, of course, uh, so the, the students have recently released their uh, publication, the Asidra publication of the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Seminary, and you will see uh, a letter from uh, Sheikh Arafi in which he shows so much support from, from Qom, Jamit al-Mustafa. That being said, there is a, a real connection with, with, our, with our honored institutions, such as Qom, such as Najaf, and for sure uh, we hope and pray that we can maintain an intimate and lively connection with our superiors and our fellow brothers and sisters who are studying abroad as well. I want to close with some very humble advice for my brothers and my sisters who are interested in pursuing uh, this path, and it was something that I had struggled with a little bit and I hope that it will be useful for yourself. Those of us who go to university or spend time in corporate America, oftentimes, and understandably so, there is a sense of disenchantment with the way corporations run, the way universities teach, the goals that these corporations have, and we begin to sometimes see how those institutions are not always as fruitful as we would like them to be. And so, sometimes what happens is that we begin to have a distaste for those organizations, we feel that they're dirty, and we feel guilty in being in them, and we seek refuge in something pure and something so much more noble. And I think I appreciate that and I understand where that's coming from. But the reason why you were to choose anything, especially Islamic studies or Hausa studies, should not simply be a way to escape from something negative, but really and truly, it should be based in something positive that I love to learn. I want to engage myself full-time, perhaps for the rest of my life, in Islamic knowledge. So that being said, um, once again, I just want to uh, appreciate um, the, the organization, Muslim Group, for allowing us the chance to speak to you today. May, inshallah, May Allah reward you for your efforts, and we ask that you uh, pray for us humble students here in Chicago, and we look forward to speaking more about some of the challenges and, and um, opportunities that we have here at the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Seminary. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I don't want to scare you. I'm not here to give you another speech. You've heard from me more than enough. But uh, I would like to begin by requesting Mujahid Islam Muslimin, Sheikh Amir Mukhtar Faizi, please come to the stage. Uh, for those of you who do know Maulana Faizi, it was his sacrifices and uh, his efforts that really laid the foundation for the seminary. Uh, and it is a matter of great pride and great happiness for myself and for our team to be working with him during this noble project. Jazakumullah. I also would like to recognize all of our students, just due to the nature of the session. Uh, we were not able to hear from all of our current students. All of them have uh, a great deal of purity and insight and a journey that they have embarked on and myself and I'm sure all of us present uh, would have derived a great deal of insight to be able to hear from them as well and to uh, maybe ask some questions from them. But I will read out their names in alphabetical order. They have put a great deal of study. This has been the first semester of studies which they have completed. Uh, they are grueling subjects, and uh, we have one member of our faculty, I won't mention who, who is also a very grueling teacher. And I think that uh, all of us should hear their names, and we will, inshallah, be praying for them uh, to be able to continue that journey with tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I will read their names in alphabetical order. Uh, Brother Ayman Mahdi. Azhar Shirazi, Fursan Bukhari, Hassan Abdul Karim, Mustafa Bukhari, Naveed Ganjani, Sakib Ali, Shan Rizvi, and Riza Himyari. For their well being, for their tawfiq, and for their success, please recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And I think that uh, I neglected to mention the name of Trent, so that means that he gets singled out for a salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> that list, by the way, had been triple checked, but I don't know how that happened. So now we are at the closing of the session, at the closing of the conference. Uh, it was truly a pleasure to be working with the Muslim group. And as we were discussing this session, one of the, the suggestions and the aspirations that came out is that this could become, inshallah, a regular feature of the Muslim group conference when it brings together so many people with so much purity and so much inspiration and so much energy and so many talents and resources to try to spotlight efforts that are being made not just on an annual basis, but that are being made on a continual, regular, day-by-day -day basis to establish and to solidify and to support the foundations of Islam within our life. These annual events can bring a great deal of resources and energy to bear to those regular events, and those continuous efforts can provide a spiritual sustenance to these occasional events. Insha'Allah, the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Seminary will be there to participate in whatever capacity it is able. And insha'Allah, other efforts that are also being made for the betterment of the Muslim community, they also will be able to be spotlighted in a similar fashion. And that is my prayer and my aspiration that we will be able to find as a regular feature. So where does that leave all of us? I hope that from what you have heard during the course of this conference and especially during this session from the beginning until now, you can walk away with the aspiration that you are a part of this project, spiritually, in prayer, and materially in your person. I hope that all of you will visit our website, subscribe to our mailing list, there is a publication, as Brother Azhar mentioned, that the students and the scholars have worked hard to put together to begin to explain not just the seminary, but the value system and the culture and the priorities 
of our seminaries and academic and religious institutions in an area and in a land where some of those things seem very foreign. And some of the things that I mentioned and that Shaykh Radwan mentioned in his talk, they may raise more questions than answers in many of your minds. The reason for that is that in some cases our expectations and even in some cases our ideals are very different from what they are within our traditional religious institutions and our institutions of scholarship and learning. And until there is a harmonization, perhaps even some adaptation on both ends, we will not be able to have that effective and that integrated type of an institution that truly is a citadel and is a support. So I hope all of you will join our mailing list, will follow that publication, will provide your prayers, your feedback, and that all of you will personally make an effort to make a material contribution. There is a contribute page, and you can do that on a regular basis. And also that you will continue to spread the word. Those types of support, writing an email, and finding out how you can contribute, all of those things are things that will be of great assistance. For those of you who have not already taken a flyer or have not visited our website, please do so. Keep us in your prayers, and we hope that we will be able to have a continued interaction. On behalf of all of us, I would like to thank first and foremost the Muslim group for their very generous support, and I would like to thank all of you for your attention and for your indulgence, indulgence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of you tawfiq, and may he grant all of you a successful conclusion of this journey and this struggle of coming to learn about Islam. And I pray that these wonderful days, I know my children were very inspired by it. I think that some of us from different ages have also found something that we can take home I hope that is something that we try to keep alive and we seek ways that we can continue to support, continue to learn, and continue to do what is right. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have, um, we're actually under time, alhamdulillah. So we have a good six, seven minutes remaining for questions and answers. If you have a question, please, um, do we have the mics working? Okay. For sisters, please come to the mic on this side of the room. And brothers, please line up by the mic on that side of the room. And we can begin the Q&A if there are any questions. Please proceed. If you have a question, please come forward. Salat al Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, Shaykh. Salam alaikum, Alama. And uh, again, thank you. I, I'd also like to thank Muslim Group. This is my first uh, conference here, and mashallah, it was beautiful. So, uh, again, my gratitude. Um, just a quick question. I've asked questions to uh, Hausa students who have gone overseas in the past, and um, it was just a, 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 what's your goal? What's your aim? Uh, what are you thinking about achieving with Hausa? I know the brother spoke about his motivation. Um, but uh, a lot of times I get the answer that uh, I don't know. So they don't know if they want to focus more on philosophy, if they want to focus on fiqh, if they want to focus on theology. I guess my question about uh, the Hausa, inshallah, in the, uh, that, that it was opened up, is there a specific focus? that the Hausa wants to take, or are you aiming um, for a broad uh, list of, of potential um, uh, scholars? This is directed to students who are... Can our uh, teachers answer that question yep. for us? Yeah, I'd like to. Okay. Is this directed to students or... Oh. I don't think this is one of those cases that uh, Sheikh Radwan was speaking about where you find some precedent. <laughs> um, uh, besides the 
you know, spiritual develop, uh, sp- spiritual dimension of you know going to Hausa because that's the primary goal. We're all going to die, right? So that's the primary goal. Besides that, um, I would say that uh, one of my primary goals outside of that spiritual component would definitely be uh, trying to uh, uh, bring Shia Islam to the larger American masses, your Walmart American, your Dollar Tree American. You know, I, I just think that you know, for the most part, you know, we kind of stay insular. You know, we stay pretty much to ourselves. And, uh, you know, you see in other schools of thought that this is not the case. So I feel that there needs to be more of a push towards uh, developing messages in urban environments, uh, messages that are catering towards uh, a larger group of people besides our, you know, four or five ethnic groups that we have. So that's, that's it. Um, but- I guess uh, just before I answer the question, I just wanted to make sure uh, I didn't come across as a as a as a work hater. I I I'm still com- connected to my uh, work in some way, and and that's a very blessed activity. I I didn't mean to come off that way. If I did, I apologize for that. Um, uh, regarding uh, goals and inspirations, honestly, I I think that um, for me, one one uh, aspect of of my journey here was. Uh, a love, uh, a love for knowledge for its, uh, for for its transforming power. I think meaning that it's a love for something that uh, really deepens my understanding and connection with with God and and God's creation, particularly my family and the and the community and all the meaningful aspects of my life. So I know that sometimes that's a little bit abstract for some people, but but uh, a love for learning really is there. And then of course. I, I grew up in a in a very beautiful community in Austin, Texas, where uh, honestly you, you you begin to realize how life giving and even life saving uh, community really can be, and and I'm, I was grateful for that. And in that in that capacity, I I would like to be able to su- serve my community and give back uh, in whatever humble way I can. Uh, perhaps Sunday school, or perhaps teaching, or perhaps in whatever other uh, talents I may one day uh, gain for myself. Okay. If we could go to the sister, do you have a question? Assalamu alaikum. Um, my question is in regards to if there is a Hausa for women, and the second, because I, I didn't really hear anything about women uh, joining the Hausa in the United States. And then the second question is um, you know, Going to a Hausa is obviously a very difficult process, as I've heard. And I'm just wondering, um, what can we do on an individual level, of course, other than our own research and our own personal reading and educa- you know, educating ourselves to kind of get to that level as somebody who has joined a Hausa, but maybe it's not accessible to a lot of us here in the U.S. or in other states. The question. Can you please repeat the second question? Sure. Um, for those that are unable to join a Hausa, because it's known that to enter a Hausa, it's kind of a you know somewhat difficult process, as we've come to understand. Um, what can we do on an individual level? Of course, apart from you know reading and doing our own research to kind of reach that certain level of knowledge and education. Uh, of someone who has entered a Hausa? So if I understand correctly, the question is for those of us who are not able to attend Hausa full-time, what is it that we can do in our personal lives to attain that level of knowledge? Yes. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I will answer very briefly because I think we are coming close to the uh, to the end of the session, although the second part of your question at the very least uh, deserves much more than a, a brief answer. With regard to the first part of the question, uh, and uh, perhaps fortunately or unfortunately, I'm only facing the brothers right now. Uh, in Medina, which was really the forerunner of this Hausa product, this Hausa project, uh, which uh, progressed under the leadership of Malana Faizi, there was a Hausa for men and a Hausa for women, and uh, both of those institutions, both of those parts of the Hausa, were very productive. Inshallah, that is. Uh, our goal, and that is something that we are working towards uh, as it is uh, feasible for us based on the logistics and the resources uh, that will be necessary 
to commence and then to sustain and support all of the material, academic, spiritual, and other needs that will be attendant to that expansion of the project. With regard to your second question, and that is really uh, the heart of uh, what I was hoping to address in, in my talk somewhat briefly, uh, in our Islamic conception, there really is no hard line between scholar and non-scholar or layperson. There is a hierarchy of knowledge and a humility towards those possessed of knowledge and a great loyalty. But it isn't the case that sometimes we might feel that, well, I as somebody who has come from a Hausa, I should be defensive and loyal towards the Hausa. Somebody who has perhaps studied in another institution or studied on their own, they should have a defensiveness or a loyalty to that institution. Our loyalty and the basis of, uh, of our affiliation with these institutions is our servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our love of his religion, his prophet, and the Ahlul Bayt of the prophet. And so we hope that as we progress, we will be able to erase some of the boundaries that exist that shouldn't exist, that will make the knowledge accessible to the extent possible for a, as broad an audience as possible. That doesn't mean that the specialization will not be there, the special competence should not be recognized. <laughs> Given that that is still a journey and a process that will take time, what I would recommend for anyone interested is to find a scholar or somebody that you can take advice from to develop a curriculum that meets your needs, that meets your constraints in terms of time, in terms of other commitments, and your abilities and your interests. And then to proceed in that way. It might not be a perfect solution, but it will be far better than for you to take where you stand right now and then to perhaps somewhat without direction or without the insight of having traversed the path, try to develop a program of study or a reading list on your own. And that is certainly a stopgap, but hopefully something that will be useful. Do we have time for another question, or should we conclude? We actually, we should try to conclude, although I'm very happy to see the enthusiasm that we have questions about the Hausa. Uh, if you're available, maybe the questions can be addressed personally after the session. And our website is available. You can and the web can AISeminary.org. Seminary.org is the website, so please visit the website. Um, if you could just be patient with me for two minutes for a few questions quick uh, announcements. First and foremost, I am a part of the Beit Alam community and we've been waiting for this project so patiently. We're so happy to see it and to see this project reach all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this project every success and blessing. Let's have a loud salawat for our presenters. <laughs> It is very important that we maintain the cleanliness of this hotel, so please take a look around. If there's anything there that should not be there, please remove it, and we would greatly appreciate that. We have donation bo boxes present at the reception desk. If you would like to donate, um, that would be very appreci appreciated. There's a volunteer sign-up list also at the reception table. Our conference is based on volunteers. It is everything that you do from the smallest to the biggest task that makes this possible. So please come forward. Today is our last day. We're having the closing ceremony in a little while. In a little while. Sign up and we will contact you, inshallah, for next year's conference. Parents, please pick up your children from childcare. Uh, the raffle is still open. We're closing just before 9 o'clock. So if you would like to purchase a raffle ticket, between $3 each. And the prizes include an iPad mini, a Nook, and Apple TV. Surveys are also present at the reception desk. Please give us your feedback. The closing ceremony is at 9 p.m. It will be very important and very fun. Uh, we have a few surprises as well as the raffle drawings. So join us for the closing ceremony. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude our final session of the 2014 Muslim Group Conference. Salat for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh,